Well, welcome in church. My name is Pierce Drake, one of the pastors here. And that is our promise. That is our reality. That is our truth. That is the truth that we serve a God who sits at the right hand of the Father. We serve a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit that is good in all things, has overcome death, hell, and a grave, that sits with you, that comes and walks alongside of you. Revelation tells us that there are these created beings by God, for God, that, that circle the throne room of heaven day and night and have for eternity and will for eternity. And they simply sing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's all they do. And I don't know where, where you are in your faith journey, if you've been following Jesus for decades or you're just checking him out today. What we do in these moments of singing out praise to him is we join in with what heaven is doing. We join in and, and as we'll pray in a minute the Lord's Prayer, it's, it's this asking of the Holy Spirit, asking of the Father through the finished work of the cross, will you make your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? We're asking God to invade this place this morning. And so I don't know what you're going through or what you've walked in here with. I know just by what today is, but also by the sounds that I hear, there are children in the room and we are so thankful. I must admit as a parent of a three and a half year old, um, I have to be honest, not today, but on most days I do know what it is to try to get them some places. So some of you may have just come in and gone, oh, we got here. We made it. You're handing out crayons. You're coloring. And you've heard the words of worship be, being sung over you. And so now as we enter into this prayer, this is my ask. Will you bring the thing that you've been carrying bef around in your life recently that's been heavy, that's been hard, and put it at his throne? Just boldly put it at his feet. That's what he calls us to. That's what he invites us to. So as we go to God in prayer this morning, I just pray uh, that we'll, we'll be able to do that for a mo few moments of silence. So let us pray. Let us acknowledge what is before us and what we carry. Let us lay it down at his feet. So God, I'm reminded this morning of David, the psalmist, where he writes that you, O oh Lord, are at his right hand as his helper, his comforter. You are at his right hand, and so you do not fear. And in the right hand of the Lord God Almighty is triumph and victory and healing and grace and forgiveness and tenderness and gentleness as you walk alongside of us. And so Jesus, what I know to be true in this moment for my own life, for my family, for those sitting in this room, we simply, whether we have said it with our words, even just being here this morning, even like coming in here into this place and sitting down and worshiping you, what I know to be true is this, is that we desire the more of God. There is more for you, for us to experience for you. There's more of you to encounter. There's more of you to, to, to call us into your holiness, to walk into sanctification, to be justified by, by faith and faith alone from the grace of God. God, you are calling us and we desire the more of you. And so we lay down the things in our life that we carry that are too heavy for us to carry in the first place. And we put it at your feet. And we worship you. We honor you. And we know that the things that we lay down today are not just simply the things that we get to lay down, but we lay, down them in, we lay them down in a community that will be faithful to walk alongside of us as the body of Christ. And so we thank you that we do not walk through these seasons alone. 
And not only do we not walk through seasons alone with the community and with you, but you also have given us the words to pray in moments that we cannot even find words ourselves. And so now we pray what you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for being a part of this church. Uh, thank you for your tithes and your offerings that allow us to, as a community, step into all that God has called us to. As Pastor Susan said, I just want to invite you again, if you're like new here and you're like, well, what is this church all about? Well, we hope you have experienced the love of God and being welcomed to this place. But come next Sunday night, May 7th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary, as our senior pastor, Mark Sorensen, shares about where this church is going forward, the vision of it. Get a picture of it to celebrate it. And, uh, but we thank you for your tithes and offerings. There's three ways you can give. Uh, there's a text to give option. Um, there is uh, online uh, from the bulletin and there are boxes on your way out. Thank you as we step into everything God's called us to together. Well, it is my honor this morning, my friends, my deep honor this morning to welcome uh, to the stage Parker and Rika McCroy and uh, just beautiful. Can we welcome them to the stage? Parker is a student at Troy uh, University in the good old state of Alabama. And, uh, and so I said something earlier. I'm born in Alabama and uh, not from there, Georgia, but born there. And I said something. He goes, you sound like you're from Dothan. And, uh, and so over there, incredible worship leader, um, man of God. And, uh, and then he'll be bringing our scripture this morning. And Rika will be bringing our word. And there's a lot that I could say about Rika, a lot of her testimony that I could share um, a woman who has, has not grown up in a Christian home, uh, grew up in a loving home, uh, but as, as she put, uh, a very uh, devout uh, agnostic, um, stubbornly agnostic. And, um, but in her late 20s, um, had a crisis of, of life, and, but also had a, had a collision with the grace of who Jesus is. And, um, and so she's an optometrist by trade. And uh, so she's gonna, she can help you see and she's going to help you see um, who, who Jesus is. And, and I will say this, uh, every time I'm around Rika, whether it be a phone call or in person, she is one of my people. Uh, and I leave, I just want to be more like Jesus and I want to spend more time with Jesus. I don't know about you, those are the people I really want to be around. That when I leave... As much as I love Rika, I actually don't think a lot about Rika. I think more about who Jesus is, his love, his forgiveness, his beauty. And so they're going to bring the word for us today. So we are honored to have you. Susan told us we could do that, so we're moving it. All right. We're going to be in John 4 today. I'll give you all a second if y'all want to flip there or just prepare y'all's hearts for yeah, meeting God through his word today. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. 
Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, said the woman to him, Give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I do not have a husband, Jesus said. For you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Out of verse 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this is really the Savior of the word, the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Parker. Hey, y'all. I, I came from Huntsville, and y'all have a Huntsville. It's awesome. I feel like we're so much alike. We have rockets and you have rockets. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good to be with old friends. I've got some old friends that are here in the house today, but they were once new friends. And so I'm so grateful to, to be with you new friends in fellowship together. We're going to jump right in. The invitation today is to come to the river. Are you ready? Okay. So it um, is a custom of mine to begin with a prayer, and I'm going to put the words up so you're invited to join me if you would like, and I keep my eyes open during this particular prayer because God is on the move, and I want to see what he is up to, and I extend my hand out just as a physical posturing to be able to say, Lord, I'm dead in the water if you don't show up, and so I can do nothing without him, and then when you extend your hands out to me, a reminder that we were in this together, that we were meant to be a community of God together. So if you'd like to stretch out your hands and read over it, and if you'd like, pray it with me. Jesus, I want to know you, and I want to make you known. So with all that I am, and all that I have, and all that I say, and all that I do, will you, King Jesus, have your way in me today? because it is in your beautiful and mighty and very much alive name that I choose to hang every ounce of my hope. Amen. Amen. So I'm so grateful to be able to join in this series about radical kingdom breakthrough. Thank you, Pastor Susan, for getting us started as we recaptured a vision of the reality that the kingdom of God is here and now. And we are called to be co-laborers, participants in the inbreaking of that kingdom. And I hope that you took her up on that call to action of write da writing down where do you want the kingdom of God to break through. And then last week, Brooke, come on now. She brought fire down from heaven as she kind of her message about the radical messengers kind of fell and all you could see was the beauty of Jesus. It's so good. It's so good. So today I'm going to give you our bottom line just straight off the bat and then we're going to spend some time unpacking it. But I hope that when we walk away, we are consumed with, enraptured with, in love with, mind blown with the beauty and the reality of who Christ is. 
So here's the bottom line. Radical faith is rooted in belovedness that results in boldness. Radical faith is rooted in belovedness that results in boldness. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start just visiting a passage of Scripture and allow the Apostle Paul to pray for us, and then we're going to jump into two stories. My goal this morning is not to explain those stories, but to invite us to enter into them. So Ephesians 3, perhaps a familiar verse to you in this passage, Paul is on his knees, y'all. He is on his knees about the reality is that there is one that makes a family out of the whole world. My little village that I was born in, Gellinger, all the way to here in the woodlands over to Huntsville, one family of God under the banner of God. He's on his knees, and he starts praying. He starts praying that they and we would be strengthened in our hearts, in our inner being, by power through the Holy Spirit. He's praying that Christ, not his last name, the Messiah, the anointed one, that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, that you and I would be rooted and established in love, and that together, it's a y'all passage, we would jump into the river, that we would begin exploring the depths and the heights and the widths and the breadth of the love of Christ Jesus, and that this love, to know this love, it's going to exceed any other kind of knowledge that we would have. And then we would be filled with the fullness of God. J.D., you tell me that. I'm filled with the fullness of God. That's wild. And when that happens, the love of God, the holy love of God fully is consuming. We get let in on a secret that the apostle Paul knew. That circumstances don't matter. That we could be in a prison or we could be in a palace. We could have money in the bank or two nickels to rub together. We could have literal chains around our feet or we could be free and it wouldn't matter because we have Christ and that's enough. He is our portion. He's our fullness. And when we come to that place of surrender, who you better watch out because the Holy Spirit is let loose to move. To now be able to do what is exceedingly, abundantly, mind-blowingly, more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power at work in who? Us. Y'all. And it's for the good of the world and the glory of Jesus forever and ever and ever through the church. We're going to the river we're going to the river. Y'all have been there for several weeks with Dan Wilt. I, I journeyed with you from Huntsville into the wild. So we're going to go back to the river this morning. But this time, I want you to take your shoes off and get in with me. So would you for a moment close your eyes? Can you feel it? How cold is the water? How far out do you have to go to meet him? Is the river deep where he is standing? Is it ankle deep or to our knees or to our waist? Can you feel the riverbed under your feet? Is it sandy or rocky or silty or smooth? Is the water clear or murky? Is it still? Or can you feel the current moving underneath you? We're still in the river. Would you imagine with me that it's been a super cloudy day and right when we reach him, as if on cue, the skies open and a single ray of sunshine is focused on him like a spotlight. Are you standing close enough to Jesus to feel the warmth of that beam on your skin? No? It's okay. Inch a little closer. There's a helper in the water. Can you see him? 
And now Jesus starts looking up to the skies and, and it's almost as though something is falling out of heaven. I just can't hardly make it out. I mean, I can see, but I can't see. I can't find words. What is that? Who is that? Did you see him rest on Jesus like a dove? Now listen, shh. Can you hear the Father's voice? Is it booming and resident, resonant and reassuring or quiet as a whisper? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now can you feel the heat of Jesus' breath as he whispers in your ear this morning? He's talking to you too. You can open your eyes. Jesus' ongoing experience of the Father's love continually poured out in his heart by the power of the Holy Spirit makes him unstoppable in his determination to defeat the works of the evil one. Jesus is the embodiment of that bottom line. The radical faith that is rooted in belovedness will result in boldness. And he writes as the source of our Christian faith is the faithfulness of God. It's declared and demonstrated in the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the faithful one. This is the story. Do we trust the story? This is the story. Have we entered the story? Eugene Peterson writes that story is the most natural way of enlarging and deepening our sense of reality than enlisting us as participants in it. Stories open doors to aspects of life that we didn't know that they were there, or we walked by them so many times we just quit noticing they were there, or maybe we've tried the door and it was locked. Peterson says that stories are verbal acts of hospitality. So pull up a chair to the table of grace. I've got some stories to tell. So the first one you will find in John chapter 3, actually just before the verse that um, the verses that Parker shared. And we're going to meet up at nighttime with a man named Nicodemus. The beloved disciple John, he had another career. He could have been a movie producer because he was, he was really dramatic and he was really good. And he sets the tone in John chapter 1 of this epic story of darkness and light and Jesus penetrating the darkness with light. And there would be some who should know that the light had come, but tragically, they would remain in the darkness. And then just a few words later, here comes Nicodemus, and he comes at night. And his first words are, Rabbi, a teacher sent from God. And so some really smart people help me understand that those words are actually code words. When he says, a rabbi sent from God, what he's really asking is, could you be the Messiah? And Jesus doesn't waste much time. He doesn't engage him in small talk. He goes right to the heart of the matter. Truly, truly, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God, dot, dot, dot. This is ironic. Because the expert in the kingdom of God, or the alleged expert, is now getting schooled in the kingdom of God. You see, Nicodemus, and you may know, but I didn't grow up in the church, so none of these stories were familiar. So if I were here on a Sunday morning and somebody was saying Nicodemus, I'd be like, who? So he was, he was a Pharisee. He was of the elite. He was highly educated. He had everything going on. He had that Amex black card in his pocket. You know what I'm saying? He could go wherever he wanted to go. He was part of the ruling class. He was the decision maker. He was the one that by day everybody would come to because he had the answers. You know what I mean? You have a question about God, you go to Nicodemus. But here he comes in the dark of night saying, Rabbi, you just might be the Messiah. So why is it that an expert in the kingdom of God would come to Jesus in the dark of night to ask a question? 
It's as though Nicodemus is saying, I'm supposed to be a participant in the inbreaking of this kingdom, and you seem to be living the life that I'm reading about. I know there has to be more. Eugene Peterson writes that Nicodemus wasn't looking for more theological information, but he was looking for a way in. Not for anything more about the kingdom of God, but a personal God slash friend to show him the door and lead him in. It's as though the cry of his heart is, how do I enter? How do I enter? I believe that there is more to life than this life, but show me the way in. And Jesus goes on to tell him on his terms, in religious terms. He uses his language. He uses imagery that Nicodemus would have been really familiar with of water and of wind. And he uses code words that we might just you know, read by, but Nicodemus doesn't miss them. When he says, like a newborn child, Nicodemus would be like, say what? Like the, like the Gentiles who, when they come into our faith, they come in at the lowest rung and we call them newborn children. You're saying that I enter the kingdom like them? And then when he says baptism, he's like, what? Baptism? Me be baptized? Why would I be baptized? It's the Gentiles that have to be baptized. They're the ones who have to renounce their way of life and their heritage. They're the ones we baptize. Me? And then I think, I'm speculating, that Nicodemus gets a little bit defensive because he gets a bit sassy. And he's like, so what am I supposed to do? Crawl up back in my mother's womb and be born again? How does this happen? How are you born again from above? And, and Jesus speaks to him of wind. And this is familiar to, Jesus, to Nicodemus. It's almost as though Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you know this. How has God always made impossible things possible? By breath. How is it out of the formless waters that formation happened and the barren waters that life came out? Breath. You know this, Nicodemus. How is it that the waters of the Red Sea parted so the people of God could pass? Breath. The Ruach breath of God. You know this, Nicodemus. The, the breath that walled up the River Jordan so the people of God could cross. Breath makes the impossible possible. You know this, Nicodemus. Take my hand. It's weighed in the river together. But first, you're going to have to take off that robe. You know the one you got on, that rabbi's robe, the one that signals to everyone who you are and where you came from. I know you earned it. I know how hard you worked for it. I know how many hours you spent memorizing and learning and studying. I know. I know how good you are at following the rules. I see you. Take off the robe. It's crushing you. That identity that you worked so hard to form, it's locking you out. So take it off. Nicodemus is right at the threshold of a breakthrough. He's lived religious faith, that quid pro quo. I do this, you do this. I do this, you do this. And he senses, he's starting to have some desperation that like this can't be all there is. Because where you're going, teacher, there's life. Where you're going, people are getting healed. Where you're going, the, the outsider is let in. Where you're going, the oppressed are being set free. You're living something I'm just reading about. And I've gotten to the place where my expertise is outweighing my experience. And I want to be part of it. He's at the threshold of breakthrough. He's at the threshold of desperate faith. He's actually experiencing it. And Jesus is inviting him to radical faith, to faith that surrenders everything. 
that Nicodemus, at least on the surface, has so much to lose. And so on this night, much like the rich young man that we hear Jesus speaking of, he walks away sad. It's good news that Jesus isn't done with Nicodemus, and we're going to find him again in just a moment. So now let's go to the story that Parker shared with us, the Samaritan woman. She is in contrast in the daylight. Jesus goes to her country, Samaria, and there's a big, long backstory about Samaria and why no good Jew would ever go to Samaria. But there he goes, and he's tired, and he's worn out, and he sits down at a well. It's identified as Jacob's well, which is significant, and and it's right there in the middle of the day. Have you ever heard of a location being described as a thin place, a porous place? A place where the veil between heaven and earth gets really thin and it's like heaven is leaking down onto earth. Well, he's sitting at a thin place because that town goes by another name. It's Shechem and a lot of heaven met earth in Shechem. It was the very first place that Abram, who was called um, by God to step out in radical faith, crosses over into Canaan, and the first place that he goes and builds an altar is right there in Shechem. It's the place where uh, Jacob's son, Joseph, is buried. It's the place where Joshua gives his farewell address. You know, the one where he's like, I don't know what y'all are up to and what God y'all are going to serve, but as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's right here. It's at the place where Jacob nearby has an encounter with God at Bethel. And nearby he has an encounter with God in Peniel. And he builds an altar. I mean, he builds a well. He digs a well right there in Shechem. It's also very, very close to that river. I hope your feet are still wet. Where Jesus was baptized. Shechem is a thin place. And Jesus is sitting there alone. This woman approaches in the heat of the day. The well was one of the only public places where women could go to hang out and gather and get caught up. And and, um, she doesn't go when all the other women go. And the morning time when it's cool, she goes in the heat of the day. She doesn't want to be seen. There's a backstory. We don't get in on it yet. But there's something about this woman that is covered with shame. I identify with her. I know her well. Jesus opens the conversation by asking her for a drink. Scandalous for so many reasons. Scandalous because he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. Scandalous because uh, he's a male and she's a female. Scandalous because reasons that nobody else could possibly know. Scandalous because Samaritans were considered heretics. Scandalous because to ask her for a drink would mean literally, would you pass me my cup and let me drink from that cup? It would be an act as intimate as a kiss to drink from someone else's cup. He's actually saying like, would you let me share in your life with you? And he would be ceremonially unclean for days. Scandalous. Jesus goes on and says, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, would you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That phrase living water doesn't really mean anything to her. She just wants some water that will last so she doesn't have to come back to this well again. And Jesus goes straight to the source of her deepest need. Go get your husband. I have no husband. She had been married, the story tells us, five times and was living with a man who, does, who is not her husband. There's a backstory that we don't know. How do you fill in the blank? 
Could it be that she was serially abandoned by death? Maybe, as it was the custom, she was married at 13 or 14, and her husband died. And then, as was the custom, she was given to the brother of the husband. She's treated like property. And what if he died? And then what if there was another brother, and he died? And then another brother, and he dies, until there are no brothers. And in a society where your only provision is through the father's house, if you are, are a woman, you are either single and never been married and under the provision of the father, or you are married and you are under the provision of your husband, who is she supposed to go to for life? So she's living with a guy who won't even marry her. Or maybe it was that she was divorced. But I can promise you that in her day, in her time, a woman had no power to issue a certificate of divorce. So if she was divorced, she had been rejected and left once, twice, three times, four times, five times. Jesus knows her deepest mean needs. Can you imagine the wounds that she carried to the well that day? The wounds in her mind, the wounds in her body. Can you imagine how she saw herself? She was powerless, without provision, without protection. Her life was a dry and barren wasteland. She was a desert. And Jesus is meeting her at a well, a place where in ancient days, marriages were often arranged. She has no idea that her heavenly bridegroom has come for her to propose to her full inclusion in the kingdom of God for you. She has no idea. I wonder if she can begin to see that God is doing a new thing in her. I wonder if she can begin to see that there is a stream in her wilderness. He knows her. He knows where she's been. He knows what she's done. But yet he asked me for a drink. Her vision is beginning to clear. She moves from Jew to sir to prophet. You need to know that this woman was not welcome in worship anywhere. Her temple, the one of her people at Mount Gerizim, had been destroyed hundreds of years earlier. Jerusalem? <laughs> she was on the blacklist in so many different ways. She's not even making it to the outer courts. Where is she supposed to go to worship? The thin place is supposed to be at the tabernacle of God. Guess what? the thin place comes to her. The thin place comes to her. And that veil between heaven and earth starts getting really thin as heaven in liquid life starts leaking down all over her. Jesus is that God slash friend that is inviting her. In. There's an hour coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit. There's an hour coming, and it is now here. Are you in the story with me? Do you see Jesus talking to you? It's here, now. I want such people worshiping in spirit, in truth. And the woman says to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the anointed one is coming. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And Jesus blows my mind. He tells her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Jesus' first 
public declaration of the fact that he is the Messiah is to this woman. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he. And this very messy messenger who still has a lot of questions But she has had an undeniable experience with the person of Jesus. She's got nothing to lose. She's filled with the fullness. She had been stripped uh, by life uh, down to the bare, but Jesus had come and clothed her with his righteousness. The Spirit of God made her impervious to fear because this Spirit that God gives us isn't timid. It's not timid. It's full of love and power and courage and a strong mind. And she goes running back into that very town, not to just tell the women, to tell everybody, come and see the one who's told me everything about me. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and they then made their way to him. Do you see the faithful one who is Jesus? Do you see him? Do you see how accessible the good news who is Jesus is? Man or woman, night or day, religious background or don't know a thing about God. You've been a rule follower all your life. You haven't followed one rule. You come from the right side of the tracks. You come from the wrong side of the tracks. You come from the preferred ethnicity. You come from the despised ethnicity. Do you see how inclusive and accessible the message of Jesus is? It's good news. He's faithful. That water of life that poured out over that woman keeps moving. And you and I have been touched by that river. It moved towards me in the person of Ruth and Marshall Laminat, who did not see our family as a mission project, somebody to share the message of the gospel with. And when my parents said, thanks, but no thanks, we're happy being Hindu, they withdrew their hands of friendship. No, because we were the object of God's love. They never stopped pursuing us. There's a river. And I think I've been sent to to you today to say there's a river. Come to it. There is a river. Become it. Worship team, you're welcome to come back up. See, this woman, she, she only had part of the Bible, the first five books, and even that had some tweaks and variations to it. She didn't have Joshua, Judges, Ruth. She didn't have the the Psalms or the Proverbs. She didn't have the prophets, but we do. And Ezekiel in chapter 47, he sees a river and it's flowing east. That's the direction that, that denotes the way that Adam and Eve were walking as they walked out of the garden place where living waters were abundant and they walked into the dry and barren wasteland. And that river is flowing in that direction. And Ezekiel sees that this river is is full of fish of every kind, kind of like people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And he sees fruit trees at the banks of the river, kind of like food that feeds and heals and cures disease. And he sees this river that's emptying itself into the Dead Sea. And that which was barren and there was no life starts teeming with life. Like what happens when Jesus shows up at a well. Jesus makes this promise to us. We see it go public in John 7. See, there was this festival called Sukkot, and in the festival, people would 
have these little tabernacles or tents that they would camp out in and then they would meet by the temple and there was a temple ritual that would happen every day for seven days where the priest would take a cistern and walk down the steps and go to a watering hole and get some water and then take it back to the steps and then pour it out from the altar and it would trickle down the steps just like a little stream. And then we'd do it again and do it again, do it again. And then on the seventh day, the priest would go seven times back to the watering hole. And at the seventh time, he would pour it out. And now that stream is, is more like a river. And the people of God are looking with expectancy to the day that Ezekiel will make that that, that Ezekiel prophecy, that day will come true there. They're waiting in anticipation. They're hanging at the edge of their seat. The priest cries out, Hosanna, save us. And right on cue, Jesus walks up those temple steps at that very moment. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, you can come to me and drink because whoever believes in me will have rivers of life flowing in you and through you. See, Ezekiel wasn't invited just to see the river. He was invited to get in it. Are your feet wet? Is it ankle deep? Maybe to your knees, maybe up to the waist. Maybe you feel your feet just kind of leaving the riverbed as you begin to swim. Did you know there was a helper in the water? The word Jesus used most often was paraclete. I understand that pa Pastor Mark just got back from Greece. And in, in Greece, if you get stuck off one of the Greek isles, a boat will come to help you. And even now, did you see the name on it? I can't read Greek, but if I could, it would say paraclete. A little boat to come bring you back to shore. So I don't know where you are in your journey of faith this morning. I don't know if you're at that place of religious faith quid pro quo. I'm going to be a really good person so that maybe, just maybe, the pain of life can't touch me. Or maybe you've seen how that just really doesn't work. And you're at a place of desperation. That there is something that the theory of God cannot touch. The presence of God must touch. Maybe there's a child that, that you have that's in the bondages of addiction and you need the river of life to come. Maybe you're in a marriage and you are in the midst of an affair and you don't know how to break free. You don't need a theory of God. You need him. Maybe it's the one who is working 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week. Just trying, trying to be somebody. Scripture tells us that the very love of God is poured out in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit if we just ask. I don't know about you, but I'm asking this morning. And I'm inviting you to do the same. There's a river at your feet. Can you feel it? It's a thin place today. You can come. You can come to the bank of the river. You can put your toes in. And talk to him. You can ask him to whisper in your ear again. He's talking to you too. Abba, thank you for your love. 
Thank you for your relentless pursuit. Thank you even before there was a creation for the reality that you were loving the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for not making us wonder what love looks like, what holy love looks like, what it means to be truly human. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have not abandoned us. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are speaking. Thank you that you are ministering. Thank you that you make the impossible possible. We come. We come. I come. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, fill me again. I bring before you three relationships. I just lay them at your feet because I don't know what to do with them. I'm asking you to heal. I'm asking you to show me how to love. I'm asking you to give me your love for those three. I'm stuck without you, but I'm waiting deeper. In Jesus' name.